This is the 2022 Ontario Winter Bible School. Our speaker for this third session is Brother Kitson Reed from Birmingham, Acox Green, United Kingdom. His theme this week is the hand of God in our lives. This is his second class in the subject for this class is in the declaration of his name. Our reading was taken from Exodus 9, 1 to 8. Brother Kitson. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Nice to be here again this morning. So in our previous session, we underlined the fact that God, in his mercy and in his guiding hand, would show his hand in the lives of his people to teach them, to guide them, to mold them. We looked at how the fact that God's people, that God saw fit for them to grow up in the womb of Egypt. And Deuteronomy describes Egypt as the furnace of affliction. And in course of time, they would come out better people. So let's continue our record as God would see, seems to me, to undermine each Egyptian God. And we will see God's hand guiding and showing that God's people, that the Egyptians might know. We underline the fact and looking at other references, particularly in uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, that God told them to cast ye away every man the abomination of his idols, and they would not, so God poured out his fury. There are a couple more references just to bolster this thought through scripture to show that God indeed executed his judgments upon the gods of Egypt. A little obscure reference, it is in Numbers chapter 33, and the other, if memory serves me correctly, is in Joshua chapter 24. Can you turn there, please, for me? In Numbers chapter 33. Just tucked away there, Numbers chapter 33, and this is now when they left Egypt, Numbers 33 and verse 3. And they departed from Ramses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month, on the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with an high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians, for the Egyptians buried all their dead, their firstborn, which the Lord hath smitten among them, upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. And that's a very powerful verse, isn't it? To really drive home, brothers and sisters, and young people, the fact that God, his intention was to undermine that all the earth might know that there is a God. And there is another one, actually, back there in uh, Joshua chapter 24, I believe. Because in, in, in Joshua chapter 24, you will know how the, the, the verses begin in Joshua chapter 24, because actually it reminds us that even Abraham's family, incidentally, were idol worshippers. Did you notice that? Joshua chapter 24, verse 1, and Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in the old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And remember, brethren and sisters, when he says that their fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood, we, of course, we have the two, two rivers, the river Euphrates and the river Tigris, and slotted in between was the land of Ur, Mesopotamia, which means the land between the two rivers. And so the other side of the flood obviously has nothing to do with Genesis chapter 6. We're not talking about that flood at all. The other side of the flood is the, is the great river. And your 
fathers dwelt in Ur of the Chaldees, the land between the two rivers, Mesopotamia, right there in Ur. And it is categorical, isn't it? Abraham's family served idols. We don't often think about that, do we? We don't often talk about that, do we? When was the last time you heard anybody talk about that? And I wonder if there's a wonderful, I wonder if there is a wonderful juxtaposition between Abraham's descendants being idols and verse 14. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. What a powerful few sets of verses they are, brothers and sisters. Put away the gods that your father served on the other side of the flood. Tigris, Euphrates, in, in Mesopotamia, and in Egypt. It, it's as if the writer is saying these significant points in history. The calling of Abraham from Mesopotamia. And when they came out of Egypt, and Exodus says, in the top context of the Passover, what does it say? It is a night to be much observed. And these two weighty points in the history of God's people, it is tainted with idolatry. What a lesson, brothers and sisters. What a lesson. So with those two verses, and I really wanted just to drive home those two verses uh, coupled with Exodus chapter 20, which we looked at yesterday. And so what we said, didn't we? That the water being turned to blood, the frogs and the lice. All those plays affected God's people in Goshen also. And the fourth play, we said, only then, only then, it's from that point on, there is a division. I will sever the land from these plagues because now they had learned. And the margin says, God says, I will put a redemption in, in that chapter. I will put a redemption from that fourth plague now. God had redeemed his people to himself. Isn't that beautiful, brothers and sisters? That God in his mercy will put us through the flames, will allow us to experience certain, certain things, but his mercy, behold therefore, as Romans puts it, behold therefore the goodness and severity of God. What a wonderful God we serve in his skillful hand to guide us and to bring us into places and situations and circumstances that will mold us and teach us and show us his hand. We need, brothers and sisters, I think, to pick up the record. We're going to go a little forward in uh, Exodus chapter 32, please, if you could go there. We're going to be going backwards and forwards and just to see how these lessons pan out in our lives. So, of course, we said, didn't we, that uh, Exodus, the, the land of Egypt, is very much a, plague, a place of death. And when we see this scene of death, when we see this uh, huge uh, tomb, you might say, it's typical of Egypt. So, what? Of the other plagues, 
were told that in the reading that we had, we had the water being turned to blood, the frogs, the lice, the flies, the moraine on cattle. Well, the Egyptians, you don't need to tell me, brothers and sisters, and I don't need to tell you, that the Egyptians worshipped the Aphis bull. And the history of the Aphis bull is uh, very uh, striking. The bull is very much uh, worshipped. It was in the context of uh, sexual immorality, certainly. Uh, and amongst other things, with the revelings, uh, the blessings on the nation, and so on and so forth. You will fast forward in time, of course, to when the king, uh, the uh, king to be, um, uh, Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin, remember. Uh, he came back from Egypt after the death of the king, and uh, he reared up two cars, remember. Remember, he got that worship back there in Egypt when he fled, when Solomon sought to take his life, you will remember. And he came back and he puts, he, he sets up two calves, doesn't he? One right up north in Dan and the other in Bethel. And he says to the people, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. Look, I'll, I'll bring the worship to your doorstep. You don't have to go far at all. You can save petrol, you can save water, you can save everything, save time, energy, everything. Just, uh, just, Go to Dan, go to Bethel, everything's good. Before you get to Jerusalem, no need. Dan, Bethel, and uh, introduce it there. And, and, and there is there are origins in Egypt. Come across them, please, brothers and sisters, to, to Exodus chapter 32. You know it well. And uh, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which go before us. For as for the Moses, as for this Moses, the man which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of the, the wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off their golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them upon unto Aaron. And they received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel. Gods? Plural? Was there more than one casting about to be fashioned? These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow. And offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. You might want to keep a marker there, brethren and sisters, and come across to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it reminds us as to really what was going on there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And verse... Seven, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And when you look at a more modern version, brothers and sisters, the terminology are words such as orgy, sexual immorality, <clears throat> words which doesn't seem it unbecoming to mention in this context, in this audience. And when you look at the original words, brothers and sisters, it really, when the verse says, and the people sat down to drink and rose up to play, it was a sexual orgy. That was taking place. 
And that's what the Athis bull represented in their worship. And what a scene, a terrible scene, when God had done so much for his people. And as I said yesterday, it took 40 hours for God to get Israel out of Egypt and 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. Exodus 32, it continues, please. Verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord. Now, no, no, notice what it says in verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people. Now, we said in, I said in, to the young people, read with care. That's good, honest Bible study. Just simply read with care. Nothing is wasted. And the Lord said unto Moses, go, get thee down for thy people, which thou, Moses, thy people, Moses, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves for they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them they have made them a gold molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said these be thy gods O Israel which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and the Lord said unto Moses I have seen this people and behold it is a stiff-necked people now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. What a thing, brothers and sisters. God was so prepared to wipe them away and make Moses the seed again. I will make of thee a great nation to wipe away the tribe of Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Dan and Naphtali and Gad and Asher and Issachar and Zebulun and Ephraim and Manasseh and Benjamin all and begin with Moses again and Moses besought the Lord his God and said Lord why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt. Did you notice that, brothers and sisters? Isn't that beautiful? It's as if he's reminding God, look, look Moses, the people that, you, your people, which you brought out, it's as if Moses is reminding God, Lord, no, Lord, your people, which you brought out. Let not your anger wax hot. God says to Moses, my anger has waxed hot. Moses says to God, let not your anger wax hot. Verse 19. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. <laughs> Lord, don't wax hot. Please. He comes down, his anger is waxed hot. And he cast the tables out of the, the hands. Now look at verse 22. And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. 
God's anger is waxed hot. Moses says, Lord, don't let your anger wax hot. Moses goes down from the mount. He sees what he sees, and he says, and the verse says, Moses' anger waxed hot. Aaron says to Moses, let not my Lord's anger wax hot. Do you notice that? It's as if the narrative, in a beautiful way, is saying there's a time to have righteous anger. And when there is the time for righteous anger, don't suppress it. Because working through that righteous anger, then and only then will that problem be dealt with. Jesus showed that in the New Testament, remember? When he made a, a, a scourge of cords and drove them out of the temple and overturned turned them, the, the, the tables. Make not my father's house. And so... Verse 22, and Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people, oh, here it comes. Thou knowest the people. Watch carefully how it slides away into blame. It's called the blame culture. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And I said unto them, whosoever hath any god, let them break it off. So they gave it me, then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. <laughs> you can just see, he throws the gold in. And you can just see the calf walking out of the fire. There it goes. The chapter tells you, in verse 4, in case we've forgotten, he fashions it with a graving tool. It is a specific point. He designs it. He fashions it with a graving tool. And now by the time he comes to the days when Moses questions him, he says, well, I just, they gave me the gold, I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf, Moses. It just, it walked out, did it? Out came this calf. You see how excuses can sound foolish when we examine it under the light of God's word. And out came this calf. So here's a question for you, brothers and sisters. Can I just have a, a show of hands as to the, the, the fact that uh, Aaron didn't die? Have you ever thought well, Aaron seemed to have got off scot free. If you have a show of hands, if you felt ever in looking at this chapter, well, it's as if Aaron just seems to just disappear in the shadows and the people are punished, and it's as if Aaron seems to get off scot free. Yes, have you, yes, one, two, three. Okay, for those of you who are on Zoom, uh, can't see, uh, you know, a, a, a reasonable amount of people seem to think that. Now, th this chapter, I'm going to show you a verse now which is, is so beautiful. I haven't made a note of it, so I think it's in Deuteronomy chapter 9. We'll have a look, please, at Deuteronomy chapter 9. Uh, keep it marked in Exodus 32, now that, now that you've lost it. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 9. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 9, it is the reference to do with, yes, it is Deuteronomy chapter 9. And I think whenever we read Exodus 32, please, please, please slot in this, these few verses here. Because God was about to slay Aaron. But look what this verse says in Deuteronomy chapter 9. Verse 19. 
for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. The context is in verse 16. There it is. Molten calf. And I looked and behold, he had sinned against the Lord your God and had made you a molten calf. Verse 19. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wrath against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. Now in our dis discoveries, brothers and sisters of God's word, please put a note however you want to remember it, in Exodus 32, that Aaron was on the cusp of destruction. And God's people were on the cusp of destruction. And God was going to start again with Moses. So let's not from now on think in, in any way, shape, or form that in some strange way that Aaron sort of just disappeared out of chapter 32 and that everything was all right and God's fury was poured out upon the people. He was the instigator. He was the ringleader. He should have known better to whom much is given, much is required. Knowledge brings responsibility. And he was about to be destroyed. But Moses prayed for Aaron. And God heard his prayer. And Moses prayed for the people. Not what it says. I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure because God was about, verse 19, against you to destroy you. What a thing, brothers and sisters. What a thing that is. Let's go back, please, to Exodus and chapter 30, uh, uh, Exodus and chapter 7. We've been working our way through the plagues. We've looked at chapter nine. <clears throat> Pardon me, in the context of the of this bull being destroyed <clears throat> in Exodus chapter nine. And look then at verse 13. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that he may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon this thy heart and upon thy servants and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand and that I may smite thee and thy people with the pestilence that thou shalt be cut off from the earth. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show to thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. And, and that's very illuminating, isn't it, verse, brothers and sisters? That, that verse is a, a sort of Daniel-esque sort of verse, isn't it? The kings that came up before Daniel. We have the Babylonian Empire. Then we have the, 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 the silver, the, 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 the Medo-Persian Empire. All right. And all their leaders. Then the Greeks. And then Rome. The legs of Rome. East and West. 
And that is it, isn't it? The rulers of the nations, they come and they go. And God is there behind the scenes, working amongst the nations. The leaders of the world are put in place to bring about God's plan and about God's purpose. Then they're taken away off the scene. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up or to make thee stand. The margin says you may have it. To make thee stand, Pharaoh, to show in thee my power. It is as if God is saying, I've raised you up, Pharaoh, that in this scene, in the history of the world, again, it will show in your life, in your experience, my power and my might in dealing by my hand that you will see the very visible hand of my existence. As yet exaltest thou thyself against my people that thou wilt not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. It's, it's really quite interesting too, brothers and sisters, when you look at, and if you have time to look at sometimes the, the, the secular history, and you look at secular history, and you, you compare it with, with scriptures, quite illuminating at times. And here is a very interesting one. This god that the Egyptians worshipped is called Thoth. And the god Thoth, the Egyptians believed in this god Thoth. And they believed that Thoth was the creator of speech, magic, wisdom. And their legend had it that it was he who poured on the ground the water of life to bring life. The God of magic, the God of speech, the God of language, the God who poured out the water of life upon the earth and gave life. That's what the Egyptians believe. You, you can read about it in secular history. It's not new. And so I wonder, brothers and sisters, if we come over with me, please, to Exodus and chapter four. And verse nine i am just so convinced brothers and sisters that because moses knew of these legends and knew of the beliefs of the of the ancient egyptians i wonder if this is exactly again god putting his finger on the pulse of the problem exodus 4 verse 9 and it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent I'm not a man of words 
neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Brackets. It's certainly not thoth. <laughs> or who maketh the dumb to death, dumb or deaf? or the seeing, or the blind, have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O oh my Lord, send I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. Oh, we said with our young people, brothers and sisters, yesterday and today, never ask more than, never read more than three verses without asking yourself at least one question. Here's my question. Why does it say, I know that he can speak well? What an interesting question. I put it to you, brothers and sisters, that in the midst of Goshen, maybe prior to the first three plagues, maybe Aaron was a sort of man who would go out and do his own open airs. What do you think? Maybe he spent much of his time going from house to house, doing mini Bible classes, mini seminars. Why is it that God specifically says, ah, notice Moses says, Lord, choose somebody else. He who that who you might choose. And he said, Oh my Lord, send I pray thee by the hand of him whom thou wilt send, or by the hand of him whom thou shouldest send. And the angel Lord was kindled. It is God's idea to choose Aaron. Did you notice that? Yes, we'll, 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 yeah. choose Aaron. I know he can speak well. How do, well, God, you. How, what an interesting question. Maybe Aaron behind the scenes was a man who was speaking well, giving Bible classes, seminars, talking to his brethren throughout the many years, encouraging them, come on, one day, one day, God will send a savior. Could it possibly be that this little verse here sheds a little more light on the life of Aaron? It is just a thought. Be that as it may, God, brothers and sisters, indeed, shows to Moses the fact that he himself was going to be one who would take the people forward in faith. Exodus chapter 9, such a chapter 10. So we've worked our way through the hail, the fact that the hail came from above, possibly the fact that the Egyptians worshipped the God of heaven, shoo the God to bring about the fire and the hail. It's interesting to know also that the Egyptians worshipped the serpent god. You will remember on the headdress of Tutankhamun, there were two creatures, the falcon and the serpent. And you remember when they went in and they cast the, uh, the, the Aaron's rod down, it became a serpent. 
And then the verse says, and the Egyptian magicians did also likewise, and they threw down their rods. And then we are told that Aaron's rod swallowed up the rods of the Egyptians. So how do you understand that? I've got no doubt in my mind that the Egyptians didn't have the power of, uh, of, of, of life. Could they do something with, with these their rods to maybe, well, they were, maybe I reckon there they were serpents in disguise, don't you? And maybe they could do something to these serpents to bring about a sort of rigor mortis state, I don't know. And they would throw it on the floor and, oh, 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 and it would start to wriggle around, I don't know. But the point is, there were dark arts that the Egyptians could do. We're told that they also could turn the river into blood or something that looked like blood. And they could also bring the frogs out of, they couldn't reverse it though, they couldn't reverse it. They could bring the frogs out, but later on, they couldn't with the lice. This is the finger of God. And so it could be, brethren and sisters, that may be. Now, what is interesting is when you go to Egypt today, they have it. You know, in, in England, we might have gargoyles, you know, to ward off evil spirits. Here, they would have the serpent, right? Uh, and, and, and the inscription would say, to deal death, to deal death to our enemies. To deal death to our enemies. And so when we are told in the chapter that their serpents were swallowed up, is that a reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 10? You're there already. Death is swallowed up in victory. And it's a quote from Isaiah chapter 25, but we won't go there because of time. Talk about time. How do have left them? Totally lost track of time. Amen. 10 minutes, thank you. To deal death. So death is swallowed up in victory. So that which would bring death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? And here's an interesting question, brothers and sisters. If we had time, maybe we might pick, pick this up tomorrow, oh God willing, which is this. Out of all the things that God could choose to represent his power, he <laughs> chooses a serpent. There's much more to that, brothers and sisters, much more to that. But maybe that's for another time. So, the ureus is the Greek word for the rearing cobra that often appears on the crowns of pharaohs as a symbol not only of their power, but of the protection of the goddess Ejo, who was represented as a cobra. If we had time, we could look at the fact that today there are uh, things which can detect hailstones. The thunderstorm that pummeled Aurora, Nebraska, on June the 22nd, 2003, left several grapefruit-sized hailstones like this one in its wake, including a new record holder. So we have now, we move on to the plague of locusts. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that the, um, the Egyptians worshipped a god called Saragia. And Saragia was a god that protected the land from locust. Well, we can definitely see God's hand here. The largest ever swarm of locust was recorded in 1889 around the Red Sea in Egypt. Scientists of the day estimated it contained 250,000 million locusts and weighed 500,000 tons. 
and anything's green in the land, it is gone. Locusts can fly 6,000 miles on an empty stomach. So, in case you miss all that information, let me give you a little bit again, if you can see that. The plague, the advance warning. Now, you need to read carefully to see, Bram sisters. There was a warning, there was a warning, there was no warning, and there was a warning. The Egyptian god, it was aimed to undermine Happy, the god of spirit of denial. The frog, Hika, Seb, Lice, Beelzebub, the god of the flies, general effects, the effects on Israel. Those of you who've got a, a cell phone, you might want to just take a quick photograph of that if you want to. And maybe some of you youngsters and just send it around. It's up to you. If not, I can uh, work out giving you these slides afterwards. Not a problem. Egyptian leaders, how it affected them, the effects on Pharaoh. Okay. This one, death of the beasts, boils and blames, thunder, hail, lightning, advance warning. So it was warning, warning, no warning, 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 no warning, 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 no warning, warning. The Aphis bull, general effects, the effects on Israel, Egyptian leaders, the effects on Pharaoh. Please take a note of that if you want to. Okay. And of course, the locusts and then the darkness. Ra, the sun god. Exodus chapter 10. Very quickly, please, brothers and sisters. I know time is rushing by. Exodus 10 and verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand. Notice here, there is no warning, right? Verse 19. And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locust. The east wind brings a locust. And whenever you read of an east wind in scripture, it brings evil. The east wind. Verse 19, the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locust. It took away the locust and cast them into this Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coast of Egypt, for the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven that there be, be darkness. Notice that there is no warning. It is a pattern. I make no apologies for emphasizing that, but it is there for good reason, brothers and sisters. Not just a, a random, it's, it's specific. There are warnings and there are no warnings. And man, one of the mightiest gods of Egypt, Ra, the sun god, is about to be defeated. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt, which may be touched, felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. There was a thick darkness in the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose up from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in its dwellings. Oh, go back to Corinthians again. What fellowship hath light with darkness? We have a camp of darkness. And in the midst of the camp of darkness, right there, nestled there in the land of Goshen, is the land of light. And Israel, but Israel had light in its dwellings. What is that light, brothers and sisters? Was that a beautiful picture of, of God's Shekinah glory? <laughs> it certainly wasn't the sun, I don't think. Maybe it might have been, brothers and sisters. I don't know how the Lord has done these things in a wonderful way. Remember how, son, stand thou still in the valley of Ajalon. In the days of Joshua, or when the sundial, in the days of Hezekiah, 
I don't know no brothers and sisters. The laws of physics. We know the laws of physics, but God is outside of those things. The creator of those things. But Israel had light in its dwellings. Was it the Shekinah glory, brothers and sisters? I don't know. Be that as it may, the camp of light was God's people. That's how God dealt with his people. And then we come finally to Exodus chapter 12, very briefly, with only four minutes to go. We press on to Exodus chapter 12. Now you will say, well, wait a minute, Brother Kitson, we've gone through all the plagues of Egypt and you've nicely illustrated to us your ideas about the fact that um, each plague was to undermine each Egyptian god, to which we will say amen. What about the last plague? The death of the firstborn. Oh, what is interesting here, brothers and sisters. Look at, um, at verse, uh, verse 12 of Exodus 12. 12, 12, easy to remember. And I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. There's another one to add to the list. Against all the gods. Margin against all the princes. The Ramesses, the pharaohs, were deities. They were gods. The Caesars were gods. Deities. Remember in, in Acts chapter 12, when Herod gives this incredible speech, he comes out in pomp and he gives his speech. And they say, he's a, he, he's a god. And he's struck down he's, and he's eaten of worms. And so there was this feeling, wasn't there? In fact, the scriptures tell us that these people and the people to come, those who worship the creature, Paul writes, who worship the creature more than the creator. And so the Pharaoh is a god. And Pharaoh's son is a god. And nothing must exalt itself above the true and living God. And the Passover is kept as a memorial, isn't it, brothers and sisters? A memorial. Well, my, my last reference, please, I've got about two minutes to go. Psalm 105, please. Psalm 105. I want you to notice something which is so exquisite. We started off by saying that in Genesis, it begins with creation. And the last five words are in a coffin in Egypt. It ends in death. <laughs> but it ends in death of hope of the future. And when you go carry my bones, hence life Death and Exodus begins with movement, a resurrection of God's people. And so if God is bringing life to his people, it would obviously mean that he's bringing death to the whole land of Egypt. So let's substantiate that with my final thoughts in Psalm 105. Notice carefully, verse 27. They showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made it dark, and they rebelled not against his word. He turned their waters into blood and slew their fish. That's interesting, brothers and sisters. Have you noticed that? Uh, 
Never read more than three verses without asking yourself at least one question. Did the psalmist get it wrong? Uh, did, the, did, did the psalmist get it wrong? Did he forget the order of the plagues? Water being turned to blood, frogs, lice, flies, marenon cattle, boils, hail, locusts. Darkness is the ninth one. Why does he mention the ninth first? And then the first second. He sent darkness and made it dark. And they rebelled not against his word. He turned their waters into blood and slew their fish. Their land brought forth frogs. He gets it in the wrong order. Nine, one, two. Why? Is it not, brothers and sisters? Is that now we've come full circle? First day light, second day heavens, third day dry land trees and plants. It is a destruction for Egypt. In the beginning, God and God said, Let there be light. Why God is saying, I'm bringing darkness to Egypt. Through the death of Egypt, you will be brought to life. And my final point, brothers and sisters, the first plague was water being turned to blood. And the last plague was the death of the Lamb. And I bring you to the Lord Jesus Christ. His first miracle. Water. To wine. And his last miracle. The death of the lamb. That his people might be free. Sister. What a wonderful God we serve. May it be that we see his hand in the tiny things that we might rejoice in his mercy. Amen. Thank you.